Welcome back, uh, Dr. Plotkin, to the virtual podium. Uh, Dr. Plotkin is going to discuss with you uh, the Intuit trial, uh, which is a promising new trial for NF2, and also the uh, first ever clinical trial for schwannomatosis. And Dr. Plotkin is the principal investigator for both of these trials. Go ahead, Dr. Plotkin. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so it's a real pleasure to, uh oh, I don't think it's working, is it? Is it okay, Patrice? Yes. Okay. Thank you, sorry for the delay. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak about novel trial designs for NF2 and schwannomatosis. These are uh, topics that are near and dear to my professional life and, and my interests. The, the first study will be following on from Dr. Fernandez Valle, Valle's uh, incredible talk about the years of work that went into identifying this molecule. So we'll tell you how we're thinking about uh, providing that to NF2 patients, as well as a, a, a first uh, human clinical trial for schwannomatosis patients with moderate to severe pain. So uh, you should know that these trials are supported by our pharmaceutical partners, and we're grateful for that support. Uh, for Intuit NF2, that's Takeda, and of course, the Children's Tumor Foundation. And our study with tenazumab is, is supported in part by Pfizer. Uh, and I have the following disclosures as a co-founder of two NF-directed companies bringing treatments to patients, as well as a consultant to some other organizations, AstraZeneca, Akus, and Sinalicense shown here. So the review that we all know, but is worth mentioning in the context of this clinical trial that NF2 is a rare uh, syndrome, about one in 30,000 individuals. We know that the typical presentation is different for adults and kids. And one of the themes of this is recognizing uh, the uniqueness of pediatric NF2 patients. In adults, we typically see presentations with uh, deficits related to the eighth cranial nerve, such as hearing, hearing loss, tinnitus, or imbalance. Uh, for children, though, it tends to be non-vestibular symptoms such as skin tumors, meningiomas, seizures, eye findings. I would probably get hurt if I talked any more about the diagnostic criteria, so I'll just say that those are in revision. And the key for thinking about clinical trials for NF2 is to recognize that there are multiple tumor types and multiple tumors in each individual patient. And I've tried to show, show some of those on the right. The top left are a typical example of bilateral vestibular schwannomas. The top right is an example of an intraventricular meningioma. The bottom left is an example of a very typical appearing cervical medullary ependymoma with a solid tumor nodule that's white after contrast, as well as an associated cyst that's shown uh, uh, above that. And finally, in the bottom right are examples of non-vestibular schwannomas, in this case, spinal schwannomas. Now, all of these um, tumors are non-cancerous, that is benign histologically, but we know the clinical course of these individuals is anything but benign uh, and can have significant uh, neurologic morbidity as well as deafness. Now, here's a list of the clinical trials that, of which I'm aware. There are probably some others, but what I wanted to convey here is in the past yeah, 12 to 13 years, we've had about 10 trials that have been performed worldwide You'll notice here uh, that, that these have all been phase two trials, and I'll show you the different targets that have been explored, primarily in the angiogenesis, uh, uh, EGFR pathway, and the, the TORC pathway. Uh, most of these, one, one nice thing is that our trials in general have included kids uh, up to the uh, three and up, or 12 in some cases, uh, so it has not been only focused on uh, adults. But one thing you'll notice is that the tumor or an endpoint study have almost exclusively been vestibular schwannomas with the exception of the single trial of Vistucertib, uh, which uh, focused on meningiomas. The results have been uh, um, mixed and bevacizumab has a very important role to play in, re in re a retention of hearing in subjects who are in individuals who are losing hearing, um, as well as some tumor responses. Some of the other drugs have had maybe some modest clinical benefit. But what you notice here is that the current design of our clinical trials is one tumor type and one drug. And that leads us to identify and discuss the challenges facing the field of NF2 in terms of clinical trials. And I think 
probably one of the key ones is the challenge of multiplicity. That is patients have so many tumor types and so many tumors. It's clear to all of us that the time between trials is way too long. It just takes so long to develop a trial, partly because of the challenges in screening drugs, but partly because of getting uh, them into the trial itself. And I would say that the Sonotos work that Dr. Fernandez Valle described has really identified multiple uh, possible drugs. We know that one of the challenges is comparing these results across clinical trials, which tend to be small. And I think one of the things that the Children's Tumor Foundation and, and, and Dr. Bacher and I and many others have spent an inordinate amount of time doing is convincing our pharmaceutical partners that it makes sense to invest in these conditions. And that's ongoing work and we've been somewhat successful, but I always hope that that becomes easier. So as we think about the field from the 30,000 foot view, we wanna take a, a new approach that's gonna make things faster uh, and, and more effective. And we've looked at two models from the oncology world called basket trials and platform trials. Basket trials are studies that look at the effect of a single drug on tumors that are driven by a common genetic alteration. So for example, in the case of NF2, since all of the tumors are driven by NF2 loss, a basket trial would be one drug to look at the effect on multiple tumor types in NF2. This possibility greatly increases the number of patients who are eligible for trials and importantly solves the problem discussed previously about what do we do about ependymomas where we don't really have good models and yet we know that these tumors are driven by NF2 loss. A second model in our field is a platform trial, and a platform trial is a kind of trial in which we have common eligibility criteria, that is, all the same, a very uh, narrow type of patient is enrolled that's clinically comparable. We use the same response criteria to say whether a drug is working or not, and then we have a common infrastructure that makes it efficient. And the idea is this promotes a comparison across studies, number one. It also makes it easy to continually add arms, as you'll see in a second. So here's an example, a schematic, if you will, of what a, a platform basket trial looks like, combining those two different design elements. Here you can see across the top, the platform nature of this is the fact that there's multiple drugs. That's the platform portion and the basket portion is tumor type one, tumor type two, and so forth. The idea being that you can get information across a range of tumors, the basket portion, and understand the differential effects on these tumors, as well as the platform portion is, how does drug A compare to drug B compare to drug C? Now, a third layer of complexity that we're adding to this is, is to design it as an adaptive trial. And adaptive trials, which has been pioneered a lot by the Johns Hopkins teams, has been uh, to um, have a planned modification of the trial based on predetermined data. So for example, uh, we look at the efficiency of a trial. We've designed futility analyses such that if the, if the compound has no benefit in the first X number of patients, you stop the trial because we don't want to expose patients to a drug that's not working. It also provides some incredible flexibility such that treatments uh, can be added or dropped during the course of the trial uh, and different baskets can be added or dropped during the trial, both of which give a flexibility that's not uh, available if you don't have an adaptive design. And most importantly, you can design these platforms as perpetually enrolling trials where you start off with drug A and drug B, next year you add drug C, the year after that drug D, and you have the same platform going. The advantage is when a drug is added as an amendment, it's not like starting from scratch trying to develop infrastructure. And that leads us to the Intuit NF2 trial, which stands for Innovative Trial for Understanding the Impact of Targeted Therapies in NF2. And the rationale is to rapidly and efficiently screen therapies for a biological effect, which we're defining in this setting as a radiographic response or tumor shrinkage. And specifically, we're looking across multiple types driven by NF2 loss, uh, meaning the basket portion, as well as if you just look at an individual tumor, you can look at how different drugs affect that and give you an idea of relative efficacy. And I wanna spend a moment here outlining the uh, design here the top gray box represents the platform trial, what we call the master study. And the bottom square here represents the individual uh, drug substudies. 
Uh, and I, I should mention, I said that incorrectly, the top portion includes both the platform and man basket components of the trial. So the trial enrolls patients with NF2 who have progressive tumors of any four subtypes. Basket one is a vestibular schwannoma. Basket two is non-vestibular schwannoma. Basket three is a meningioma. Basket four is a pendomoma. Now, in order to enroll these patients, they have to have common eligibility, and we analyze them using common endpoints, uh, and that provides the platform component. Individuals then with uh, progressive tumors get randomized to one of many drugs. Now, currently, we're starting with drug A, brigatinib alone, and I wish I could report to you today that I had 10 companies who have agreed to give us 10 drugs. We're not there yet. That is our vision for the future. So currently, the randomization involves only being uh, allocated to drug arm A, which is brigatinib. Patients will then get treated with brigatinib uh, until uh, and evaluated for a response. Uh, in the case that an individual um, has growth of a tumor, we call disease progression, they then return, they stop treatment and return back to the master trial where they can be re-randomized to a new drug uh, as soon as they are eligible. Now, one of the great features of this design is we think we want to bring a patient who has growing tumors. If, if drug A doesn't work, they cycle back, they can get drug B, and they cycle back, get, uh, get drug E, you know, the, uh, continually allow patients an opportunity to respond. So where is the Intuit NF2 trial open? You can see here that we have six sites, including uh, Johns Hopkins, Mass General Hospital, the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, New York University in New York, University of Miami, and the University of California, Los Angeles. You can see the PIs of each of the sites. Uh, it's been an amazing effort put together uh, by our group with the help of the Children's Tumor Foundation. Unfortunately, I can't give you results today. I'm gonna tell you more about the trial, but I just wanted to mention here, this trial opened in June, 2020. So that's about seven, eight months ago. And it's been gratifying the participation of families and patients. We've already enrolled 17 subjects to date, 10 at MGH, seven at NYU. And that's because we continue to open sites around the country. This has included 10 subject, 10 participants with vestibular schwannoma, two with non-vestibular schwannoma, which is a condition we've never tried to treat before, three with meningioma, that's just, that's a new area. And for the first time ever, two individuals with a pendomoma. And happily, we expect enrollment very soon, uh, both at the Mayo and at Johns Hopkins. And we're very grateful for all the hard work of both of those uh, teams. Uh, we will be opening all the sites. Uh, we don't know all the timelines yet, but it's uh, all the sites have been working very hard to uh, overcome the hurdles, as you can imagine, with opening such a complex trial. So I want to explain a little bit more about the master trial design, and I want to credit Lorenzo Trippa, our statistician, for a, a very complex trial. Um, in the master portion, uh, up to 80 eligible patients are going to be enrolled. They must have progressive tumors of one of those four baskets. As I mentioned, the master study is an allocation protocol. It just says, you go to drug A, you go to drug C, you go to B. Uh, we expect that each drug substudy will have 40 participants. Uh, and as I mentioned, the, the, the master trial is an allocation structure. There's no medicines you get treated with in the master. We hope the master protocol is open for 10 or more years, which shows our commitment on behalf of the CTF, as well as the institutions to uh, run this program and identify active drugs. Here are the primary objectives overall of the whole study is to determine the biological activity of uh, NF2 related tumors. We're doing that using radiographic responses, that is tumor shrinkage. We're very interested in safety and tolerability and Dr. Wiedemann and Dr. Gross mentioned with these long-term treatments, you have to be very careful and respectful of long-term side effects. Uh, in our exploratory objectives, we want to see also, is there any benefit of these medications on hearing response? We want to assess how long it takes tumors to grow, if they grow. We're very interested in quality of life. And one thing I'm very proud of is we are pioneering uh, the use of qualitative patient interviews with Dr. Merker um, to study this. That is to ask uh, participants about the effect of the trial on their life and the effect of the drug on their life. Is it better? Is it worse? This is an attempt to have patients and uh, speak in their own words 
what has been good, what has not been good about participating. And we think uh, incorporating that patient voice will really inform uh, this study. And finally, we'll be looking at relationships between biomarkers and clinical response. That is, can we predict those individuals who will respond to medications? One has to have a clinical or molecular diagnosis of NF2 to enroll. Subjects, uh, individuals have to be 12 or older. I mentioned already about these uh, different baskets, and I should mention we have a definition of progression that allows people to look back over three years to document tumor growth. The tumor has to be measurable, and people have to have a good life expectancy as well as a certain performance status to participate. There are some exclusion criteria, can have been treated recently, can have had radiation to the target lesion in the past three years, you have to be able to uh, tolerate MRI scans, and pregnancy is typically a problem as are lactation and, and, uh, and a different uh, uh, um, exclusion criteria. Those who have uncontrolled intercurrent illnesses obviously uh, present uh, a barrier to participation. Before I talk about Bergatinib, I just wanna mention some of these correlative studies um, one of them is, of course, to understand better the relationship, relationship between genes and response. And so we know that all of these uh, genes are located in that region of chromosome 22. Uh, we also know that there is a relationship, a genotype-phenotype correlation. That's from the Manchester group. So we're going to be collecting samples of blood uh, and tumor to identify the pathogenic variants in the NF2 gene and correlate that with outcomes. We're also making a, a collection of all the imaging studies to do some uh, um, artificial intelligence and deep learning uh, approaches to, to determine whether looking at these scans using kind of these computer algorithms can help us predict which individuals are likely to respond to brigatinib and other drugs. So how does the drug substudy work? And an example of this, of course, is the brigatinib substudy I'll get to in a moment. We're gonna enroll uh, participants in two stages. Stage one, 20 participants will be enrolled to any of the four tumor baskets. Now the key is each basket must have at a minimum of two people so that we ensure that we're getting information about all four tumor types. After 20 uh, participants are enrolled and have been evaluated up to six months, we're gonna to look to see how many individuals had responses in the target tumor. If there are no responses, that, that whole arm will be closed for, due to futility. If, however, we see one individual who has a 20% response, the study will accrue 20 more participants. And in an adaptive design, we're going to narrow this down to the, the two baskets that have the best response rate. So we're going to say, here were the four baskets. It worked in this. It didn't work in that. Let's take the ones where it worked the best and enroll the final 20 uh, participants. We hope that'll enrich the possibility of identifying a, a clinical response. So how did we get to brigatinib? Um, I'm going to skip these because Dr. Fernandez Valle just did a much better job than I'll do. I just wanted to point out the testing pipeline, which started with uh, humans and mouse cell lines and ended in a clinical trial. I think to the credit of the team, um, we were able to, to achieve this uh, kind of lofty goal and end up in the clinical trial we're discussing. And as, uh, uh, as she said, uh, there was benefit both for the, for the schwannoma models shown here, this is for brigatinib, as, as well as the meningioma models, and, and, and you've seen this data just recently. I, I too wanted to uh, emphasize that the reason that we believe brigatinib might be active has to do with what we call off-target effects. That is effects outside of the effect on ALK, which as uh, Dr. Fernandez Valle showed, is really not the target in tumors uh, driven by NF2 loss. Uh, it, this is a dirty kinase, and I'll come back to that uh, in a little bit. So what are the endpoints for the brigatinib study? Uh, I've mentioned these in more detail here. The radiographic response is what we're most interested in. Uh, secondary endpoints are looking at this toxicity, hearing, time to growth for tumors, change in quality of life, uh, response rates for non-target tumors, safety and tolerability. And so this reminds me to say, the target tumor is the tumor that's actively growing, but we measure up to six tumors. So you might have, let's say, a growing vestibular schwannoma, but we can also measure two meningiomas, a spine tumor, and an ependymoma. And so one of the nice things is we're going to be collecting data, multiple data points for each participant 
to try to really assess, address the issue of multiplicity, that is multiple tumors. Brigatinib is dosed at 60 milligrams a day for, excuse me, 90 milligrams a day for the first week, and then escalated to 180 milligrams a day if there's no side effects. Uh, I'll just say that has to do with some lung toxicity that was identified in lung cancer patients. Uh, we haven't seen that yet in patients, and we hope that's not an issue. Every patient has been escalated to 180 milligrams. And even more importantly, even in the pediatric population that we've enrolled, uh, all of them have tolerated 180 milligrams a day. Here are the expected toxicities for brigatinib. As you can see here, many of these reflect the patient population in which the drug was approved, that is lung cancer patients who tend to be significantly older than NF2 patients on clinical trials. And it should be no surprise that some of the things we see are related to that, including pulmonary events, bradycardia, tachycardia, hypertension, of course, pancreas, liver, other organs. I would say the others that we want to point out are asymptomatic, increased CPKs, much like we heard about for selumetinib, as well as photosensitivity, which is a new risk that just came out this week. I do want to address pediatric issues in NF2. Uh, I'm, we're committed to including our pediatric patients in our studies. Uh, we know that children with NF2 appear to be more severely affected as a general statement compared to adults. And therefore, we were able to work with Decatur to, to allow us our recruitment down to the age of 12. Uh, we did not, we have some additional ascent forms for these pediatric patients, but we did not change the pediatric dosing and that has worked out fine. We also included some important safety language uh, and, and here at the suggestion of the FDA. So um, we are not uh, yet prepared uh, to discuss results because we are still accruing to, into the stage one of the Brigadino substudy. I look forward to trying to pull that data together with all of the other PIs uh, probably in the fall time range roughly is when we're expecting to get that. So exciting days uh, and we hope to have some interesting results to report back. I wanna now transition to schwannomatosis which is a condition that is phenotypically so similar to NF2 and yet one of the defining features of this condition is pain. And so I've, I, I would assert that schwannomatosis can be, considered, can be considered a pain syndrome. And in addition to that, patients identify it as being probably the most important issue related to, um, er, related to schwannomatosis. Now, um, it's important also to think about pain intensity, but there are other ways of looking at pain. If you do look at pain intensity, more than half of patients uh, report having severe pain, that is five or higher on a zero to 10 scale. We believe that this may be more severe pain may be more common in patients who have LZTR1 loss, although that remains to be proven. We know that surgery can sometimes help for very localized pain related to a specific tumor. And yet for many patients, surgery is not curative for their pain and they have total body pain uh, that's not amenable to surgery. I wish I could tell you that there was a drug X that helps schwannomatosis pain. That has been just not the case. We've Patients have reported narcotics, anti-inflammatories, neuropathic pain meds, there's really no class that does better than another. I use this image about the opioid epidemic because one thing that is an important uh, contributor to the burden of schwannomatosis uh, is the shame that comes with being treated with narcotics and the guilt. And I would argue that our patients, many of whom desperately need narcotics, have really suffered during the opioid epidemic, either through forms of addiction uh, or uh, through the stigma that comes with requiring narcotics. And I'll just say that there's no clinical trials to date and it's time for us to start. And so this is our first attempt. I will very quickly show you the rationale for this study, which is antagonism of nerve growth factor. Uh, and what you can see here is inflammation, injury, and disease can lead to expression of this molecule called nerve growth factor, which then binds to a receptor on nerve cells in the periphery which then sends the pain signal to the spinal cord. And there are multiple mediators of this pain pathway. And if you look down here lower, you can see that in addition, that many types of cells can express nerve growth factor, including tumor cells, but also inflammatory cells as such as eosinophils, lymphocytes, macrophages, and so forth. And binding of uh, NGF by these cells, which all are together in the microenvironment can lead to expression of other active factors, including NGF, histamine, uh, and, and other uh, uh, mediators 
which can open a, a pain cascade. And I would just point out that there, we believe that one of the reasons this pain is so challenging is that there is an inflammatory component as well as a neuropathic component. You can see here an example of histology of a schwannomatosis schwannoma of an individual whose tumor has both inflammation and this brown stain here is expression of nerve growth factor. So tenazumab is a human monoclonal antibody that antagonizes nerve growth factor, which prevents its binding to the TRAC-A and P75 receptors and it leads to downregulation of this cascade uh, of uh, pain molecules. Now, tenazumab is, is a, uh, a, an experimental agent not yet approved by the Food and Drug Administration produced by Pfizer. It's being studied primarily for a painful osteoarthritis. And I wanted to show you just a little bit of the data so we get used to it because we're going to be interpreting this soon. You should know that tenazumab program was put on hold in 2010 by the FDA because of an unexpected safety signal of joint failure. This is in patients who have uh, arthritis. And that hold was lifted in 2012. That's when I contacted the company. Actually, I contacted them, contacted them before then, 2011. This really has been 10 years in the making. So what does data look like for tenazumab? What you see here is a graph that shows week of treatment on the x-axis, on the y-axis is change in the pain score. Everything going down obviously is a reduction in pain. And what I want to emphasize for you here is every group had a reduction in pain treated with tenazumab, including the placebo group. And that really reminds us that every pain study, every pain study requires a control group of a placebo because we have responses to pain. Uh, uh, even when we're not treated with active agents. So really important to remember. So the objectives of this study are to compare the analgesic efficacy of tenazumab versus placebo through eight weeks of study. So it's a, an injection and then you follow for eight weeks and you measure at that point. The secondary objectives are to look at tenazumab, uh, a safety of tenazumab and to look at change in pain pain interference, anxiety, depression, all those things that are important in patients who have chronic pain. And very quickly, I'll just say the enrollment criteria, we're looking for schwannomatosis patients older than 18 with uh, greater than five out of 10 pain intensity, that's moderate to severe. Um, you do not need to have a confirmation of schwannoma on imaging to participate. They do have to abstain from non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs given the risk of the joint failure and we also cannot accept people who have orthostatic hypotension or autonomic neuropathy because NGF is found in, in, in those pathways. Very quickly, after screening, patients get randomized to either receive tenazumab or placebo for eight weeks. But since we didn't wanna only give patients placebo, we don't think that's ethical, every patient will receive tenazumab for another eight weeks, and then we will follow participants for six months. And so this is what makes this novel is it is a randomized placebo controlled trial because that's a standard in pain research. We need to get the uh, correct answer. This is called a delayed start design so that every patient can get treated with drug. And for the first time, we're studying a clinically important scenario of pain. Here's the toxicity profile for the drug, including many neuro, neuro, neurological symptoms, I'll say, like abnormal sensations, paresthesias, hyperesthesia, hypoesthesia. Some people have reported neuropathy or even a worsening of autonomic neuropathy. I told you about worsening of osteoarthritis. I'll just say that these are what we've been reported. Our early um, studies haven't revealed any reported adverse events to date, and we'll be updating that. So, uh, before I acknowledge everybody, just to say that we've enrolled three participants to this study. We're always looking for more participants. Unfortunately, it is a single center study uh, where people will have to come to Boston, but uh, we hope to be able to generalize these results soon. And with that, I, I want to thank an incredibly large and, and wonderful team uh, that has uh, participated, including all the group from Sonotos, as well as the Intuit studies the team of the Children's Foundation, Takeda and Pfizer, and of course, all of my colleagues at Mass General Hospital who participated over time. And I'm of course, happy to answer questions. Thank you. Mil gracias, Dr. Plotkin. Muy interesante y, y realmente schonomatosis es un tema que a mí también me, me intriga mucho y el dolor es algo muy importante. Estoy mirando a ver qué preguntitas hay mientras que... Así, dame un momentito. Um, 
Dame dos minuticos. Dame dos minutos. Ok. Ok. Uh, eh, lo voy a leer en inglés. Lo van a traducir. Bueno, le dice, I'll read it in English. I'll read it in español. No. Thank you for your work. Um, this is a doc. This is a doctor from Spain. Uh, my daughter is 20 years old, has been diagnosed with NF2. She currently is taking Bevacizumab. Would it be possible to take Brigatinib for patients with NF2 before finishing the essay? Um, As are you planning to publish some results of the trial so that it can be used before the study finishes? Thank you. So that's that's a great question. Um, I think that our intention, of course, is to publish the results. Uh, however, uh, I don't think we'll publish them before the Bergatinib sub-study is done. We will publish them before the whole 10-year program is done, but not before we enroll all of our patients who will receive Bergatinib. The only thing I would add is that in many countries, this drug, Bergatinib, is available off-label, but we all vary in our ability to access that. I, I would encourage people who are benefiting from other treatments such as bevacizumab or other treatments not to rotate off onto brigadinib until we know the results. I would hate for somebody to stop taking a treatment that worked in hopes of getting a benefit for brigadinib before we've had a chance to analyze the results. We, we're, we're optimistic, we're hopeful, but we also don't want to guide anybody uh, wrong. Uh, we have another question here. Um, Thank you. I, I'll take the yes, other pregunta, Dr. Plotkin. This is de la doctora Patricia Ciavarelli de Argentina. Eh, Dr. Plotkin, tengo dos pacientes con schwannomatosis eh, que el dolor respondió al bevacizumab. Me gustaría saber sobre su experiencia. Gracias. This is the Patricia, Dr. Patricia, I know it's good to hear your voice. Um, uh, so such a good point. You know, we also have put together a retrospective study of bevacizumab because many of us have tried that as a last ditch effort. And our experience matches yours with some modification. I would say that about a third of patients did have a nice response to bevacizumab, but a lot of ours didn't as well. And um, I think it opens the door later on to understand in a formal way uh, the benefit of bevacizumab and other drugs and whether there's some accommodation. So I've been reluctant personally to recommend that for everybody, uh, but it's clear that for some individuals it's been beneficial. I, contact us if you wanna submit that with the rest of the, uh, of the people. We, we're always interested to hear about people's experiences. Congratulations on that. Yes, I see uh, one other question here. Um, nice presentation, sí, Dr. Plotkin. Eh, My name is Moises Fiesco, eso. Mexican geneticist. Have you explored the combination of tenezumab with other painkillers as for synergy? Thank you. Another good question. We have not done that, but let me elaborate. The way that we design this is because of the risk of joint failure, unfortunately, uh, participants can't be on that long term in the study. So they come off, if they're on that, they come off, but they are allowed to continue narcotics. They are allowed to continue neuropathic pain medicine. So we're not requiring them to come off all of their medicines. So there is some synergy there, but we have not yet um, combined, you know, two novel agents, so to speak. And again, I think this is our first study that I'm aware of. I feel like there's so much to learn about crawling before we can run. You know, is this the right trial design? How would we think about combining medicines and so forth? I think that's exactly where we want to go. Uh, and I think hopefully that's where we'll be in a couple of years, but not yet. 
Doctor Plotke, mil gracias. Creo que estamos uh, listos para nuestra siguiente presentación. Muy amable. Hay más preguntas, pero al final podemos tener nuestra uh, questions and answer, más discusión. Mil gracias, doctor Plotke, nuevamente. Thank you, thank you.